The next approach that I want to talk about to uh, genetic tree improvement is hybrid breeding or the use of hybrids um, to improve genetic outcomes in forestry. Um, there are a couple of reasons that people might produce hybrids and, and backing up, just defining hybrids just means an interspecies mating. So we're, you know, sometimes familiar with hybrids in our um, lay life. So for instance, uh, mules are a hybrid between a donkey and a horse. Um, very often hybrids uh, take place between different species within one genus, but sometimes they might occur across genuses. Most forest tree hybrids are within a genus though. Um, and there are a couple of reasons that people use hybrids. And one of those reasons is, to, is a hybrid vigor. So hybrid vigor is just a situation that occurs when the offspring from a hybrid uh, mating produces uh, or perform much better than the parents. So typically, when we mate two individuals together, we expect the offspring to sort of perform at the average of the parents. But sometimes when we do a hybrid mating or when we uh, mate two very unrelated individuals together, uh, that will produce offspring that far outperform the parents. Um, and when that occurs, that's referred to as hybrid vigor. This example on the screen is a hybrid mating between Populus trichocarpa, black cottonwood, times Populus deltoides, which is eastern cottonwood. And researchers found that uh, that hybrid mating often produced hybrid vigor. Um, so there are stands of this hybrid growing in the Pacific Northwest that grow very rapidly. They're usually grown as clon clonal stands. So these are pictures of clonal stands in Eastern Washington. And it's sort of hard to see the scale, but um, this is a clonal stand of this hybrid. And these trees are probably 60 feet tall, 20 meters tall, and three to four years old. So they grow very fast, maybe 20 feet you know, six uh, meters in height in a year. Very uniform. Uh, they're grown in irrigated and fertilized stands. Very rapid growth. So sometimes hybrids are used to produce hybrid vigor. Um, eucalyptus that's grown commercially in the South America and other locations is often grown in clonal hybrid stands in, in this same way. Another reason sometimes that hybrids are used is to introgress genes from one species into another. So it's sometimes termed introgression. When you introduce or you attempt to move genes uh, that are desirable from one species into another. So this is two species in the southeastern US. Um, shortleaf pine and loblolly pine. The natural range of shortleaf pine is shown in blue. That's very large range and it overlaps with the range of loblolly pine which is shown in green. And especially in the past, uh, there was a big desire to produce loblolly pine that was more resistant to fusiform rust than natural populations were. Fusiform rust, really important fungal disease um, and as it turns out, natural populations of shortleaf pine are more resistant to fusiform rust than natural populations of loblolly pine. So there were attempts early on to hybridize shortleaf and loblolly to attempt to integrate those rust resistant genes from shortleaf into loblolly. Um, some of those efforts were successful. They did get some resistant material. But at the same time, traditional tree breeding efforts were also breeding for resistant to rust 
uh, to fusiform rust and and those efforts have progressed so i think those hybrid breeding efforts have essentially been abandoned because the traditional breeding for rust resistance in loblolly pine has been highly successful but that hybridization leads to sort of an interesting side story that i uh, want to tell you so before European settlement and, and European dominance of the, of the eastern U.S., like I mentioned, Loblolly and shortleaf pine had overlapping ranges uh, with quite a bit of overlap, but hybridization was rare between those two species. And that's because uh, even though they're, they had large overlap in their ranges, those two species lived in different habitats within those ranges. So Loblolly uh, lived mostly on wetter habitats within that range, maybe sort of on river terraces um, within that range, whereas shortleaf pine is more drought resistant and lived uh, more on the upland parts uh, of habitats within that range. In addition, um, loblolly pine seedlings are not fire tolerant. So even when they did reproduce uh, into the uplands, when wildfire came along, those seedlings would be killed. Whereas shortleaf pine, uh, as I believe I mentioned earlier in an earlier lecture, they can uh, sprout from seedlings uh, after they've been killed back by fire. So shortleaf pine seedlings are adapted to fire and can re-sprout after fire. So that reinforced the sort of dominance of shortleaf pine in the uplands and the absence of lovely pine in the uplands. And that sort of separation of those species in space, even within those overlapped to the range, prevented a lot of hybridization um, naturally between those two species. But what has changed since uh, after European settlement? No, I think the answer is pretty clear. One, there's been a lot of fire suppression uh, after European settlement. So that has allowed uh, where loblolly regenerated in the uplands, it allows loblolly to suppress. And in addition, loblolly uh, has moved into abandoned farm farmland after the after widespread farm abandonment after the Civil War. Loblolly easily regenerated into those abandoned farmland. And also loblolly has been widely planted as a plantation species, especially after World War II. So loblolly now exists in the uplands in locations where shortleaf would have dominated in the past. So loblolly is coexisting with shortleaf uh, in places in the uplands where it hasn't in the past. And that has led to more hybridization between those species than naturally occurred in the past. If you read the Tower et al. 2012 uh, reference that I have in your reading list, they tell the nice story of the increased hybridization between these species that has occurred after European settlement. settlement. And this has caused some problems where in fact they've discovered uh, that for instance, um, there were some state nurseries that had um, shortleaf pine seed orchards that when they genotyped them, they found they actually had some significant amount of loblolly pine genome in those, what they thought were pure shortleaf seed orchards because of this hybridization. Um, so really interesting story about how the genetic composition of material on the landscape can be altered just due to how uh, we manage the landscape. Uh, so an interesting story there. Another important case study involving introgressing genes from one species to another using hybrid breeding is the case of the American chestnut. I think most forest people are familiar with the chestnut story where um, prior to the 20th century, American chestnut was probably the dominant hardwood growing in eastern forests. Um, achieved huge proportions, it, it was abundant. Uh, humans and animals highly dependent on it. Uh, 
but then an exotic fungal pathogen was introduced from Asia and it functionally wiped out the chestnut from eastern forests. <clears throat> you can still find chestnuts uh, in the forest. This is a photograph I took in northern Georgia of a chestnut sprout. Um, but this is probably about as big as you'll ever see them. They sprout from uh, dead stumps, um, grow a little bit, and then get reinfected with the chestnut blight and get killed back. They, they generally don't reach reproductive size. So they're functionally extinct uh, from the eastern forest. And there's been a, a lot of uh, effort to develop American chestnut material that's resistant to the blight so that we can in some way reintroduce the chestnut into eastern forests in the United States. <clears throat> and one approach that's been taken uh, is by the American Chestnut Foundation, where they start with a hybrid mating between American chestnut, which is uh, highly vulnerable or susceptible to the blight, and Chinese chestnut, which co-evolved with the blight in Asia and is resistant uh, to the fungus. So they cross those uh, and they end up with a hybrid that's 50% American, 50% Chinese chestnut. They select um, hybrids from that generation that are half and half. Each individual half, has half of each genome. Find ones that are, are resistant and then they take those and breed them with pure American again. Okay, so that's called a back cross. Um, so once you do that back cross, you now the offspring from that mating are three quarters American chestnut genes, one quarter Chinese chestnut. You screen those to find uh, individuals that are still carrying the resistant genes. You take those and you back cross them again to pure American. So you get a seven eighths. Um, American, one-eighth Chinese. Screen for resistance, back cross again to pure American, and keep doing that until you get a generation that's 15 16th American, one sixteenth Chinese, but that 16th Chinese includes those resistance genes. And that generation can be reintroduced to the wild because it's almost all American, but it still retains those Chinese resistance genes. This effort uh, with the American Chestnut Foundation is led by Jared, Dr. Jared Westbrook, who has his PhD from the University of Florida. Uh, so we're proud to claim him uh, as uh, a gator, and he's leading that hybrid back cross approach to generating material to, to repopulate eastern forests. At the same time that this has been happening, there have been efforts to identify the genes in Chinese chestnut which confer resistance and then to transgenically move those genes into American chestnut. So that ch transgenic approach has also resulted in resistant material. So both of those programs operating independently have arrived at material which is close uh, to being able to be deployed. Now you know, none of these are perfect. I know some of the hybrid back cross uh, material, for instance, is highly susceptible to other fungal diseases. And certainly the transgenic material, there's some um, public resistance to deploying transgenic material wild into forests. But suffice it to say, there have been a lot of scientific efforts over decades to produce material that can be used to reestablish uh, American chestnut into American forests. Now, if uh, you go out into the world and you are uh, become a natural resource manager, it's likely that at some point you're going to be involved in decision making with regard to genetics, what genetics to plant in a particular location. So I think it's important that you know, for instance, what has led, what the process was that led to genetically improved material. We've just spent uh, quite a while talking about that. I think it's also important that you know what kinds of questions to ask when you're purchasing genetically improved material. 
Now, you know, how much uh, time you can expect a vendor to spend with you answering questions will depend on how much you're buying. If you're buying a bag of 100 seedlings, um, there's probably a different amount of time a vendor will spend with you than when you're coming to them to buy half a million seedlings or a million seedlings. So that's going to vary. But in the end, I think you deserve the answers to questions. And so I like to give you some guidance in terms of what kinds of questions you might ask. So here's some questions um, that I suggest you ask uh, for, for instance, pine, especially when you're shopping for pine. And, and one question you might ask is from which tree improvement program does this material derive? So for, um, for southern pines, for Loblolly and Slash Pine, there are three main, really three tree improvement cooperatives or programs. One at North Carolina State University, one at the University of Florida, one at the Texas A&M, Texas A&M Forest Service. That's where all of the improved Loblolly and Slash Pine and Longleaf Pine comes from. Um, so some of these questions are as much to maybe even less to know the answer for yourself, but just to make sure that they know. You want to make sure your vendor is knowledgeable about these kinds of things. If you ask them this question and they say, what is a tree improvement program? Think about whether this vendor is knowledgeable. That's Sometimes the question is less for the answer and more to understand the vendor. Uh, the second is, um, to what extent are these, um, or maybe is this material improved for growth relative to wild or unimproved. So in this lecture, you know, I've been talking about, wow, 30% improvement relative to wild. Th those numbers are quantified for different uh, stages of improvement. Um, now, again, if you're buying a bag of 100 seedlings, they might not reveal this information to you. If you're buying half a million seedlings, they need to tell you um, this number. We know that this material that you're buying has 30% improvement for growth over wild. Okay, and they, they should be able to tell you that. Third, um, what if any disease resistance characteristics do these seedlings have? Um, tree improvement programs have primarily worked on fusiform for southern pines, mainly fusiform rust and to some extent pitch canker. This is still early on, but those are two important fungal diseases in southern pines. Uh, in other regions, for instance, when you're buying white pine, you can likely buy white pine that's genetically improved for resistance to white pine blister rust, for instance. Um, so you can ask them, what's the improvement for resistance? For fusiform rust, they should be able to tell you the R50. The R50 is, for this, this material, if it's growing, uh, under rust pressure <clears throat> that produces 50% rust infection in a susceptible check population, what is the degree of rust infection for this improved material? So 
for instance. Uh, basically what this means is the lower the better. If your R50 is 10, that means this material, if it was growing alongside a susceptible family that was 50% infected, this family would be 10% infected. And again, if they say, what's an R50? And you're buying half a million seedlings from them, you might want to go somewhere else or ask if there's someone else that can answer that question. Another question to ask, uh, is this material half sib, full sib, or clonal? You would think that that's a straightforward question that would be widely advertised, but I'll show you some advertising materials in a minute. And it's apparent that it's not always obvious what is what. So sometimes it's useful to know what the nature is of the, of the material you're buying. And um, you could say here, here is where I plan to plant. Is this material appropriate? So the geography. So I, I've showed you seed transfer guidelines for Loblolly Pine. Um, a well-informed uh, vendor should know which zones you can plant particular material in. So you should ask them. Um, some vendors have these guidelines out there. I went to ArborGen's website. ArborGen is a seedling vendor and they have a document you can get saying the top five questions all customers should ask before buying seedlings. So these are their top five questions. And there's some similarities to some of the kinds of things that I mentioned. You know, I think this is great. I think ArborGen is encouraging you to ask questions. And of course, they have answers for you because they want to sell you seedlings. But you know, there are, there are some very reputable companies out there that I think are well able to answer these questions for you. And sometimes you do need to, to ask them. You know, here's uh, Arbergen's page on what is the appropriate, appropriately adapted seed source for my planting location. And they, you can see they're, they're showing that Schmitt, Schmittling uh, seed deployment guideline and they're showing you where you should plant this material. So, you know, Arborgen is providing answers to, to these questions. So clearly, you know, one potential vendor that can knowledgeably answer your questions. And there are others out there as well. I'm not um, holding Arborgen out there as the ideal. Um, you know, this is some more material from Arborgen's website and I'm not picking on them, but for instance, some of these, uh, they may be using different terms than we've used in this class. So varietal. What is, what is varietal? Varietal means clonal. These are, this is clonal material, but they don't use the word clonal. Um, mass control pollinated or MCP. You'll see this term a lot. This basically means full sip. OP, open pollinated. That's a term that maybe you'll see a lot. This means half sip. That means they know the mother tree, but not the father tree. Um, so, you know, sometimes in uh, advertising language or marketing language may be different than biological language. So just ask questions, that, that's important. Um, you know, here's some material from International Forest Company, another highly reputable company. Um, they were listing their material as advanced, elite, and CMP. You know, that's, that can be difficult to, to uh, dissect. CMP stands for controlled mass pollination. So I think we can discern that this is full sib material. And it's more expensive than the others. So what are advanced and elite? You know, that's a good question to, to ask the vendor. You know, what's the difference between advanced, elite, and CMP? Is advanced half sib and elite full sib? Or are advanced and elite just different 
degrees of genetic improvement? You know, those are just questions you need to ask. And again, I'm not picking on this company. This is perfectly valid marketing, but it just means you need to ask questions to be fully informed. This is the website for um, the state of Florida to buy bare root seedlings. One thing to point out is that usually seedlings are priced per thousand seedlings. So for instance, $95 um, dollars per, per thousand works out to 9.5 cents per seedling. Okay, so these range from, you know, nine, nine and a half cents to 22 and a half cents per seedling. Um, so, you know, they're telling you, for instance, here, second generation rust resistant slash pine. That's pretty informative. Uh, that's slash pine. It's been through two generations of improvement and it's been bred to be rust resistant. Um, and it's $50 a thousand. That's five cents a seedling. That's quite a bargain, actually. This is probably half sieve material, but you could ask them. Um, this is lobelay pine, one and a half generation improvement. So maybe it's less along in the tree improvement process, but it's also five cents uh, per seedling. You know, it's also important to ask whether the, you're getting bare root or containerized material, uh, but at any rate, uh, most of the people that work for these these companies or the state of Florida are well informed and, you know, love talking about this stuff. So make sure to to ask them questions and tell them Dr. Martin sent you.